Ahora es el momento de escuchar al rabino David Rosen. Ravi, thank you very much for your presence here. Thank you very much for your willingness, willingness to travel to Spain and to join with all of us a seminar and an opportunity to discuss issues of, of common interest, particularly the dialogue between Jews and Christians. El, el rabino eh, David Rosen mm, dirigió en su momento una congregación muy destacada en Sudáfrica, de ahí pasó a ser rabino principal en Irlanda, culminado a su etapa en el año 85, pasó allá a Jerusalén y dentro del gran rabinato ocupó básicamente responsabilidades sobre diálogo interreligioso. Subrayar que fue parte del equipo eh, israelí que negoció las relaciones entre el Estado de Israel y la Santa Sede, al tiempo que, que presidía el Comité Judío Internacional sobre consultas eh, interreligiosas, particularmente para el diálogo con el Vaticano. No lo debió hacer muy mal, porque el año 2005 el Papa le, eh, le nombró comendador de la Orden de San Gregorio Magno. Poco después, el año 10, la reina de Inglaterra le hizo miembro de la Orden del Imperio Británico. En estos momentos, y voy a concentrarme en lo que considero más significativo para este acto, su currículum es, es muy impresionante, es miembro de la Comisión de Diálogo Interreligioso del Gran Rabinato de Israel y es el director internacional dentro de la American Jewish Committee, que es una de las grandes asociaciones judías norteamericanas con una gran presencia en todo el mundo de lo eh, relacionado con eh, el diálogo interreligioso. Por último, eh, dentro del centro creado por Arabia Saudí, el denominado Centro Internacional del Diálogo Interreligioso, Rey Abdullah, representa al Estado eh, de Israel. Dicho esto, David Rosen, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Portero, um, Your Excellency, Kvota Rav, Reverend Gentlemen, Distinguished Professors, Ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure to be with you on this day of blessing, because when rains come down where they are appreciated, it is a day of blessing. And it is an opportunity for me to not only uh, dis discover in greater depth your wonderful university, but to express my appreciation to you for the work you do, and that is emblematic in this event to promote relations between the Catholic Church and the Jewish people, between Catholics and Jews around the world. So first of all, let me bring you the blessings of Zion from Israel. May God bless you from Zion and may you see the good of Jerusalem. And may we all work together indeed, as Father Florentio has mentioned, for a better world. Um, in a way, It is now not necessary for me to say anything, because with the presentation of the ambassador, who uh, has summarized the history, and with the uh, words of Father Florencio dealing with the issues, everything that needs to be said has been said. But I think it was Woody Allen who said, everything has been said, but not everyone has said it. <laughs> So maybe I can say it in a few things, perhaps with some added inflections in a um, different way, but it gives me the opportunity to hopefully be more brief so that we can have more time for questions and answers and discussion. And uh, I really enjoy that much more. And I hope that when the opportunity for questions come, you will not pull any punches. In other words, you will be as frank as possible with me. I like difficult questions. I want you to ask the real burning questions where you have a captive rabbi and you want to ask anything of interest to you. So I look forward to that. Um, to give a different angle, I'm going to go back to a historic event to try to dramatize what we are dealing with, to understand that this is, in fact, something of stunning proportions historically. I will argue this, I will try to present this, and hopefully I will convince you. But to, dr to dramatize it, let me take you back to 1904, where the seer, the visionary of Jewish national political renaissance, Theodor Herzl, 
was hawking his wares around the European capitals, trying to get support for the Zionist idea. And he managed, quite remarkably, to achieve an audience with Pope Pius X. And he records in his diaries the discussion in this meeting, where in his naivety, Theodor Herzl presented his proposal and thought that the Pope would see Jewish sovereignty as a way of protecting the holy sites for Christianity. To his surprise, he records, Pope Pius's response, which was, we cannot support this movement. We cannot prevent the Jews from returning to Palestine, but if they do, our priests will all be there with holy water to baptize them all. Now, Pius X was not a particularly difficult person. Many popes would not even have given Theodor Herzl the time of day. He graciously received him. He was simply telling him what had become, what was for most of 2,000 years, the normative Christian theological approach towards the Jews. Indeed, while Father Florencio talks about a gradual development, this teaching of contempt, to use the language that Jules Isaac, the French Jewish historian, used when presenting the problem to Pope John, Saint John XXIII, this teaching of contempt is already there in the Church Fathers. And for the Church Fathers, it was testified by a historic reality. Justin Martyr says, Look, the temple of the Jews has been destroyed. They are scattered around the world. They are hated. What could lead to such a terrible fate other than that you have committed the greatest of crimes and that you are guilty of deicide and God has rejected you and has replaced you with the new Israel, the true Israel, the church? You have finished your historical purpose. Which begged the question, why then did the Jews continue to survive? St. Augustine comes with an answer, which is, the Jews survive in their humiliation, homelessness, and suffering to prove the truth of Christianity. Until the final advent, when they will see the error of their ways, and therefore will be the final proof. So you have, therefore, a view of the Jewish place in history, which is a view of not just of contempt, but of condemnation to wander, to be vulnerable, and even to suffer. And therefore, Pius X was simply telling Theodor Herzl what was normative Christian theology. The idea that the Jews could return home to their historical homeland and establish sovereignty before they had embraced the Christian faith was an anathema. So keep that moment in mind and consider where we are today, where popes describe in the language of St. John Paul II, the Jewish people as the dearly beloved elder brother of the church. The people of the original covenant never broken and never to be broken. The religion with which we have, these are all quotes, huh? Quotes of John Paul II. The religion with which we have an intrinsic relationship that is unlike our relationship with any other religion. And take Pope Benedict who says, yes, this image of the brother is very nice, but you know if you look at the Hebrew Bible, the elder brother does not come out very well. He is normally pushed aside by the younger brother. Therefore, maybe we shouldn't talk of brother, we should talk of the parenthood of Judaism. But the very fact that a pope is so sensitive to language that might be offensive to Jews in some way is an incredible testimony. And today we have a pope who everybody in the world knows is a friend of the Jews, who has said 
that it is impossible to be a true Christian and be an anti-Semite. This is not new, his predecessor said it, but probably the world has heard it thanks to Pope Francis's charisma in a way that it's never heard before. This is a stunning transformation. There is nothing like it in human history. A people that yesterday were seen as being in league with the devil, the enemies of God, the most condemnable and the most contemptible, is now seen as the uniquely beloved, a relationship with a church like no other, a special virtue and closeness and proximity that is intrinsic to Christianity's understanding. There is nothing in human history as dramatic as this transformation. And we often just take it for granted. We need to stop, stand back, and appreciate that what we are celebrating in this 50th anniversary of Nostra Aetate is the greatest revolution in relations between peoples, between peoples of faith that has ever taken place in the history of humankind. Yes, this revolution is a restoration. It has restored Christianity back to its roots. It has restored the brotherhood, the sisterhood, the fraternal relationship. But its drama is no less because of that. What facilitated this amazing transformation? Well, there were, of course, certain processes of development, historical perspective, the impact of modernization, both negative and positive, a more critical look within the church at itself, at its own history. But there is no question that a major, major impetus for this transformation was the Shoah, the Holocaust. The Holocaust was an overwhelmingly, not exclusively, but overwhelmingly Jewish tragedy. But it was a Christian scandal, not because it was a Christian campaign, God forbid. Nazi ideology targeted Christianity in its own way as well. But it was perpetrated by overwhelmingly baptized Christians in ostensibly Christian lands. And this led to a very, not immediate, but dramatic process of what we call in Hebrew cheshbon nefesh, reckoning of the soul, that took place within the Christian world. There are personalities who in historical processes personify a, an event, a development that is much bigger than themselves. Very often they are ne nevertheless singular in their own way. And the one personality above all in this process was Angelo Roncalli, who was the legate of the Pope in Turkey during the period of the Second World War, and who was one of the first to receive information of the Nazi extermination of the Jews, and who was deeply moved by the information he received and did everything he could do possible to both influence decision makers and to be able to save Jews personally. Probably Roncalli's influence was the major factor in King Boris of Bulgaria's resistance to Nazi instructions to deport the Jews. Pope, uh, sorry, Roncalli was responsible for issuing of thousands of false baptismal certificates when still baptized Jews could escape the clutches of the Nazis. You here can appreciate that. Somebody who is not a Catholic perhaps thinks that's just a document. But you understand that a baptismal certificate is a confirmation of a sacrament. To issue a false document is not a simple matter. But he understood that there were lives at stake and he did not hesitate. When he became the ambassador, the nuncio of the Vatican in France, he played a critical role in influencing Latin American countries to support the partition resolution of the United Nations that led to the establishment of the State of Israel. 
And to many people's surprise, after the death of Pope Pius XII, he was elected as Pope and took the name John XXIII. And therefore, the relationship between the Jewish people was something that was personal for him in a very dramatic way. And I mentioned before the meeting between Jules Isaac, the historian, with Pope John XXIII, which he then led to the commission for Cardinal Bayer to prepare a document that would address the relationship to the Jewish people. Father Florencio has referred to Cardinal Koch's comment, in which he referred to the significance of Nostra Aetate as a new positive approach of fundamental esteem. In fact, Nostra Aetate has been described as a Copernican revolution in terms of the attitude of the church to the Jewish people. But it is important to understand what this revolution is. Nostra Aetate essentially said four things. Incidentally, Nostra Aetate's promulgation was not a simple historic development. Those of you, some of you will be familiar that there was great opposition to promulgating a document that would deal constructively with a relationship with the Jewish people. The opposition came from many sources, not least of all, a very conservative theological position that identified with the historical norm, so-called normative approach that I described earlier and was resistant to idea of a positive approach towards the Jews. But probably the most powerful lobby against this document was, came from the bishops within the Muslim world, particularly the Arab world, who were fearful of any political implications about any positive state towards the Jewish people, lest this be interpreted politically, which certainly there was logical reason to assume so, and that it might affect the interests of the church within the Arab Muslim world. Eventually, and some would say with almost miraculous providential guidance, the document was promulgated by Pope Paul VI, only after the death of John XXIII. And the document contained four very important statements. One, that any attempt to present the Jews as cursed or rejected by God, and therefore replaced by the church, is wrong. <laughs> this is a very dramatic statement. It says that basically the way Jews had normatively been presented over the course of the majority of Christian history was wrong. It said that any attempt to present the Jews as collectively guilty for the death of Jesus then, let alone in perpetuity, was wrong. It affirmed the eternal nature of the covenant and it condemned anti-Semitism. Now, many people think that the repudiation of the Deicide charge was the revolutionary nature of Nostra Aetate. This is not correct. The repudiation of the Deicide charge was already clearly enunciated in the Council of Trent 400 years earlier, where the church affirms, first of all, that from a theological point of view, a Christian theological point of view, Jesus' death is part, therefore, of God's plan for the redemption of humanity. So what a ridiculous idea to be able to attribute guilt in such a process. But at any rate, anyway, there were, as Nostra Aetate says, different elements involved in this process. And of course, crucifixion was a Roman procedure and not a Jewish procedure. And therefore, it was uh, while there were different elements involved in this process, to talk in generalities would be totally inappropriate. This was not a new idea within the church, though it was very important that Nostra Aetate expressed it. It was also not new to say that the covenant between God and the Jewish people is eternal, because you could still understand that eternal nature of the covenant in a negative, derogatory manner as Augustine interpreted it. Yes, the covenant is eternal for the Jews to suffer to show that Christianity is right. Even the use of the olive tree, which we all see so beautifully, is not necessarily automatically positive. 
because you could say, yes, the root of the olive tree sustains the new branches, but that's its only purpose of existence, to sustain the new. It has no integrity or life in its own right. So the revolution of Nostra Aetate was this switch in which all these things were now no longer to be seen negatively, but to be seen positively. And this was the approach, the teaching of esteem, which began to replace the teaching of contempt. And therefore, Nostra Aetate was, as Rabbi Diseni of Rome has very appropriately described it, the beginning of the beginning. But it was an amazing beginning because it meant a whole revolution in the mindset of the approach towards, of the church towards the Jewish people. Father Florencio has described, uh, and the ambassador as well, uh, the different documents uh, that were promulgated. And uh, I will add a little bit to that, but the next stage after this amazing development for which we must give John the 23rd and Paul the 6th together with him the copyright comes of course with the papacy of John Paul II. Saint John Paul II takes this relationship to new heights. And he takes it to new heights in a very special way because John Paul II, if I may say somewhat flippantly, knows the language of Madison Avenue. What do I mean, knows the language of Madison Avenue? It's a historical paradox that it was a pope from the behind the Iron Curtain that understood that we live today in a world of images, if you like, of advertising. And that people today do not read documents. In fact, part of the problem today is that people do not read. But people do see. And there are images. And John Paul II intuitively understood that as important as what he might say, it was the image of visiting the great synagogue in Rome, the first pope ever to do so, that would cause a dramatic communication of this new relationship. And so it did. To see John Paul II embracing Rabbi Toaf in genuine friendship was a powerful message around the world that we live in a new era of Catholic Jewish fraternity and mutual respect. But within Jewish circles, there was still a suspicion, and maybe even within Catholic circles, that the idea of the Jewish return to its ancestral homeland was still something of a problem. After all, the church did not have diplomatic relations with Israel. Interesting in parenthesis, the secretary of John the 23rd, Bishop Loris Capovilla, who I think is still alive and 103 or 104 years old, said that it was John the 23rd's intent, after dealing with the relationship with the Jewish people, to establish diplomatic relations with the state of Israel. But as I said, he did not live to see even the promulgation of Nostra Aetate. He was succeeded by a more cautious pope, in the person of Paul VI. Maybe when Paul VI visited the Holy Land in 1964, it was uh, not an official visit. Maybe he was testing the waters, and maybe the reaction led him to draw back. Uh, but of course, he saw the promulgation of Nostra Aetate. Then there was, of course, the Six-Day War. And therefore, there were political complications in that regard. And the church had formally, the Vatican said that there were no theological problems with the idea of the state of Israel. And that the only reason that it did not have full diplomatic relations had to do with the political reality. I remember very well, I have been involved in this relationship for a very long time. Uh, it, this is a with the help of some boot polish and plastic surgery, it may not be so evident. But nevertheless, I remember the 25th anniversary of Nostra Aetate, being in the Vatican for that. Incidentally, this was the first time a kosher meal was served inside St. Peter's in the Vatican on that occasion. 
And now it has become almost normal with the Pope's friends having kosher meals in the Vatican. But then it was something very special. And I remember walking across St. Peter's together with Cardinal Villebrands, who had succeeded Cardinal Bea as the president of the Pontifical Council for Christian Unity and the Commission for Relations with the Jewish People. And I said to him, you know, is the problem with Israel really just a political one? He said, absolutely. Not only do we fear the repercussions in the Arab world, we have been threatened that if we do anything, there will be consequences for our churches and our communities. And then as a result came the uh, Gulf War, first Gulf War, the Madrid Peace Conference, and then the Vatican was open to negotiations with Israel that led to the establishment of diplomatic relations. And I was privileged to be part of that team that negotiated that agreement. I remember very well the statement, the response of the spokesperson of the Vatican, Joaquin Navarro Valls, to the question, why now was the Vatican negotiating with Israel over diplomatic relations? And he said, maybe more than he realized when he replied, all the Arabs are talking to the Jews, why shouldn't we too? And maybe one could answer that the church should be a leader in taking initiatives and not just a follower waiting for the others to take the initiative, but better late than never. And so the establishment of diplomatic relations was not just a diplomatic act. It was a powerful testimony that the theology, the ideology that Pius X had articulated to Theodor Herzl had really been banished by the church and that the church genuinely had no problem with the reestablishment of independent Jewish life in the Jewish people's ancestral homeland but on the contrary celebrated this as a testimony to God's fidelity and to the fidelity of the people and its relationship to the land. And indeed, that, that diplomatic agreement paved the way for the historic visit of John Paul II to Israel in the year 2000 on his Jubilee pilgrimage. Now, as I said again, most people do not know documents and they do not know, and certainly most Jewish people did not know at all about this transformation. Especially in Israel, you need to appreciate that in Israel, most Jewish people in Israel have never met a modern Christian. Amazing. Yes, we love to travel abroad because we are so isolated, we love to get out. But when we travel, we meet non-Jews mainly as non-Jews, not as modern Christians. So for most Jewish Israelis, the image of Christianity was still, and for many still is, the image of the tragic past. But because people watch television, and because the visit of John Paul II had amazing TV coverage, Israeli society saw a pope at Yad Vashem at the Holocaust Memorial, with tears flowing in solidarity with Jewish pain and suffering. They learned about how he had saved children during the period of the Shoah, how afterwards when he was a priest and even a bishop returned Jewish children who had been taken in by Catholic parents and baptized and directed that they be returned back to their natural Jewish parents. They saw him at the Kotel at the, Jewish, at the Western Wall putting there the text of a prayer he had composed for a liturgy of repentance that had taken place two weeks earlier at the Vatican, asking God's forgiveness for sins committed against the Jewish people down the course of history. This blew people's minds. Nothing was more dramatic testimony that this relationship had, had undergone a total radical revision and return to this fraternal relationship of genuine esteem. And as I say, we now have uh, a relationship which, to some extent, we almost take for granted. This is both good and bad. It's wonderful that we can take this relationship as one that is natural and the way it should be. It is bad that we do not always appreciate it as much as we should. But of course, this is not an even hue. Things can change on the Olympian heights but they need a certain sociological reality for them to be translated down to the grassroots. 
in places like the United States, and especially the United States, where you have vibrant Jewish minorities, neither a majority, but both total active and very dynamic communities, alongside one another, there the internalization has been dramatic. There have been two Jewish surveys of Christian textbooks in parochial schools, and the materials are generally so good, a few Jewish Sunday schools could do with having those materials in them. But there are other parts of the... And also in the United States, there is an association of Christian Jewish centers, study centers. There are more than 30 university centers for Jewish-Christian relations. The vast majority are Catholic. In Europe, maybe we have three. Maybe, and even then, I'm not sure whether you can really put them on the same standard as you can in the United States. Why? Because you have a dynamic, large, vibrant interaction there. And there are probably other reasons as well. There are certain parts of the world where there are no Jewish communities, or where Jewish communities are very small, and where the Jewish-Christian relations do not even feature on the radar screen. So the educational challenge ahead of us is still not a small one. But we are now at an age of where we can have a document that comes out using this quote from Paul that God does not revoke his gifts, which not only summarizes his transformation, but starts looking at a theological understanding of one another on the basis of, I use Pope Francis's word, complementarity. This is an amazing new stage in our relationship. Not only have we tried, not only has the church rejected the negative past and embarked upon a new present, but it is looking forward to a new future in which we understand one another in relation to the divine economy at large. Obviously, the Jewish response takes time. The wounds of history are not old. And as I say, most people still do not encounter the new reality. But the statement of the rabbis, which was originally, I think, 25, now about 80 Orthodox rabbis, maybe 100, have already signed on to that, is a sign that the understanding of this transformation has permeating through into the Jewish community, slowly but surely, and ushering in what I think will be, must be, pray will be, a glorious future of mutual collaboration between the Catholic Church and the Jewish people. Thank you.